Thank you for all coming. I apologize for the mix-up in the email that went out, or did, clearly did not go out last, last week. Uh, so I'm glad you were able to be here for the presentation. Uh, Matthew is going to uh, is going to then walk us through a proposal for the artwork and the location. And I'm just going. That's your introduction. Thanks. We're going to leave it very simple. <laughs> Thanks. It's nice to be back for the heat. Hoping it's going to get much hotter. I've just been assured it will. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> um, so thanks for having me back. This is the conceptual design phase. So I'm going to talk you through, guys, the kind of the story of how I approach the work, uh, the site, and sort of hopefully explain it in a way that will allow you to tell the story to other people. Because um, it's an interesting project, I think. And then I've left a few, I want to emphasize at the very beginning, this is not a complete proposal. There are, there are options to, to look at. And I very much value and really appreciate input on that part of the process, because often ideas come up very late that are amazing ideas. And often ideas that I've had that have traveled all the way through the process turn out to be harder than one thinks. And it's a good, so please you know, keep the dialogue open as we go along. Um, so to me, one of the really great appeals of this was like trying to think about what what kind of art do you make for an art school? Because I've done projects you know, for the Justice Department or the FDA, they all have a story. And the story of kind of art is, it's sort of notoriously impossible to define. It's really the story of imagination, which is this endless exploration of the perimeter of being. Like the, what we're engaged in is trying to not paint or draw or design what is, but to imagine what is yet to come. And so I kind of started thinking about the history of that, and there's a really nice connection, the kind that people like me really love when you come across this little fact that Kepies and Maholinaj and Prestini were here uh, in the 40s, and they talked about, before it was even CVAD or even SOVA, the idea of the Bauhaus became part of the kind of woven into the identity of the institution, this interdisciplinary practice. So it's, for me, that's a kind of lovely historical echo. So I started thinking about um, this, how the Bauhaus imagined this idea of the perimeter as an organizational idea. It's very German, you know, you can sort of see everything's got little boxes. Even though it's interdisciplinary, everything's kind of nicely divided up. But it was probably the first um, organization, really, to ever try and integrate all of the arts into one kind of institutional framework. You had in the Renaissance, it was all guilds and so forth. So then there's kind of Paul Clay's beautiful drawing of the Bauhaus, which is I much sort of more kind of down my street because it's like all the boundaries are beginning to dissolve and everything becomes this kind of beautiful inscription on, on the future, imagined as sort of as like this free space. So then I started thinking about Paul Clay and you know, really his pedagogical sketchbook, which is the second book published by the Bauhaus. And it's this amazing, I'm sure you guys have all read it and studied it, but I'm going to give you, for those of you that haven't, it's this um, kind of poetic description of how to draw. It starts with an arrow and a line on a walk. He says it starts with a line on a walk. And then out of that comes this kind of idea of drawing in space and time and the pressures that this arrow feels in relationship to nature and how this kind of drawing moves through space and time. And then he comes sort of quite late in the book to what he calls the formation of the black arrow, which I think is kind of one of the most kind of beautiful ideas in, he's really articulating the kind of dynamic that underlies how we think about spatializing information, like how do we draw information? Because for clay, everything in nature can be found by sort of drawing. And then you've got this kind of whole pedagogical institution that comes after the Bauhaus, you know, like Alfred Barr's kind of strange idea of this kind of family tree of art, Marshall McLuhan, <laughs> Various, you know, Krauss, um, Clement Greenberg, Junius, Tropicalia, and the Intermedia diagram of Higgins. Um, this is a more recent one by a New York artist, which is the art game. You know, in his version, you sort of make your way from Brooklyn up to the Met, and you've made it. We have this kind of idea of um, drawing this perimeter of being, like how to. How, so this idea, like, of an institution that's trying to frame itself as a carrier of thought, yet wants to retain the openness of thought. That was kind of what fascinated me about this kind of problem of how do you sort of describe an art institution. 
This is this very strange diagram that MoMA produced. It's like sort of showing you the difficulty of this as we enter the computational age is that everything becomes data. This is really just an Excel spreadsheet made to look pretty. Um, and that's, of course, what we're all dealing with, as well as this idea of the kind of interconnectedness of information from, this is a 1933, this is when it began, same time as the Bauhaus with Moretti's sociograms. And now we've ended up you know, with something like that. And the kind of parallels and the way this is affecting the human brain is something that I think we're all probably very aware of. How, are we being sort of, is the internet there to serve us or is it gradually mastering us? Notice how you know, everyone has one of these, you know, never more than two feet away, right? You're like, where is it? <laughs> Where's my brain? <laughs> so, and then the kind of other side of all that is like going back to Paul Clay. He was the person who, um, this is this funny drawing that, that Angelus Novus uh, that Walter Benjamin talks about. It's the angel of history. And in Benjamin's telling, which is, he, uh, he describes a picture that's nothing like this. This is very kind of grim description of the angel of history looking backwards and seeing death and destruction and ruin. But it's all based off this kind of goofy kind of character that Paul Clay actually drew. Um, so I kind of, I've always thought this is an interesting tension and I'm interested in this idea of whether we can imagine a kind of another kind of angel that's closer maybe to Clay. It's an angel that's one that's looking forward. And what would that be like? Rather than imagining this kind of relentless historical progression as only sort of one of ruin and chaos and disaster, it's sort of thinking about what is yet to come. And so I, that was, those are the, just to give you the sort of little background of when I sort of started to break down my interest in the project and thinking about a work for an arts institution as opposed to for a science laboratory or anything else. So this idea of this kind of angel of the future is something that I've worked a lot within my own work as well. So it's very close, dear to my heart. And I think it's kind of, as an artist, what artists are doing is trying to imagine this themselves in a way as this person who can show you something that has yet to happen or the beginnings of it, its arrival. And this has a strong basis in philosophy as well. This is a text by Daniel Birnbaum uh, talking about uh, Varela's idea of like, maybe we can flip the script so there's this, Varela uses this term retention to mean memory, and then there's the president, and he uses this fancy word protention, which is really a word for imagination. So if, if you sort of turn this diagram around, we're all full of memories of the past, but start to replace those memories with the idea of you can have sort of memories of the future. Like what kind of space would you want to generate? It's really the space of thinking is what I'm interested in, this kind of informational space, where rather than everything being mapped out like the internet, we're saying everything is open and yet to be filled. So that's a kind of where I began thinking about the project itself was a kind of space generator, a shadow generator, a kind of ambiguity machine that could occupy and sort of, if art has a sign, it's the sign of the unknown. It's the sign of what we're inviting people to say, you don't know the answer. That's why you need an artist. That's why you need a designer. It's not just solving a problem. For that, you need an engineer. For problems that don't have yet have solutions, that's what you ask artists for. So that's the kind of space I was looking at and thinking about the building as well. And going back to Clay again, this idea of what constitutes nature, you know, there's a kind of effort that we all undergo to sort of evaluate nature as something that's we've we've in, indulged ourselves, I think, with a little bit of what Latour calls hyper incommensurability, in that we've kind of pushed nature away. Um, and we're sort of denying the fact that we are, of course, nature, like people are nature, artists are nature. And if, if artists have another role, it's to kind of embody that, the mystery of nature as it's happening. That's why I think we, we love images of people doing things, because we're not, we're not just looking at their clothes and their hats, the funny hats that they wore in the 19th century, but we're looking at them as people, as mirrors of ourselves. So the, when we were thinking about the site, I kept thinking about this kind of shadow space in, in t space and time and where that could all happen. So that's kind of how, I, how I've been sort of thinking through the project. And then pragmatically, we, we looked at the building very carefully and uh, we identified a number of possible sites at the start for artworks, moving sort of from the western side to the eastern side. And 
for various reasons, they're all listed down here. It's a bit like sort of Goldilocksy. One's too high, one's too low. <laughs> you know, one's got this, one's got that. We kind of boiled it down, talking to the architects, between the western and eastern facades. And I'm going to talk you through most of the discussions seem to be a consensus that the western facade, I'll, I'll talk you through the reasons why, offered the most potential. Although it seemed initially that the eastern facade um, was very, was equally sort of valuable. So locations one and two, that's this, the gallery, the back of the gallery wall. This is sort of a funny site because it's really the front of the building towards the university, but it feels like the back. Uh, sort of clearly the architects were not thinking about it as the front. Although there's, and now with the new orientations, there's going to be new entrances through there. But they're pretty, you know, it's, you could call it charming or just rough. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's the, uh, the other side of the building, which has a lot of, it's all the new stuff, it's all sort of fancy, but it's got kind of traffic issues. That's a big fire lane going through there. It's got um, public access issues. It's got weather issues. It's got an, a number of issues that make it, although it seemed initially very like the, the immediately obvious choice, I think we came to the conclusion generally that it was probably less than ideal for a a project that was really going to do the kinds of things that I'm talking about. Um, so it's a nice, gently wood slope, west-facing site. Um, it has the doorways on either side. Um, and one of the advantages, this is I'm sort of referring, you'll see these little things, captions here, they're all referring to the contract. These are things I'm supposed to talk about, so I'm going to sort of relentlessly go through them, ticking off the boxes. <laughs> Um, it has some, uh, because it's got uh, so much work to do, we're going to save some money as well because it's, you know, reconstruction, drainage, lighting, plantings, new pathways. Those can all be integrated into the artwork, which gives you a kind of force multiplier. If you're sensitive, you can start to integrate them into the actual artwork itself, thus making it sort of really resonate and become a natural place rather than an artwork sort of dropped into another architectural program. So I started thinking about this little kind of plaza, and nicely it turned out that was a proposal that had been put forward early in the process and then kind of abandoned for cost reasons. So it's a kind of way of reclaiming even the history of the site development. Um, but it's a kind of funny plaza because it's really shady. It's surrounded by trees. So it's more of a crossroads than a grand public plaza. I think it will feel kind of intimate and uh, be kind of welcoming. And it also creates a kind of doorway to the rest of the university. Like it's a way, it's going to be talking to the main path of the university from the the stores all the way down to the stadium. And somebody else, it wasn't me, said what they liked about it was that it kind of concluded the new construction project by including the old building, which had been kind of, you know, it's like the redheaded stepchild, just going to get, you know, a haircut basically and a, and a wash. <laughs> <laughs> and this actually kind of recuperates that into the narrative and this kind of the story of CVAD, which is it's still going to be 50% of the structure, right? Is that old building or something around that? Now it kind of completes the perimeter of the space. So, and you can sort of see from this, there are, you know, these are the, in green, there's the public path connections that kind of, it's unclear to me if bikes, there are bike racks, and whether biking is permitted or not permitted is a kind of gray area <laughs> there, but I'm pretty sure there will be, given the presence of bike racks in the plan, bicycles. So you can, it's easy to imagine this is a, is a cycling zone, and a, I think there'll be quite a lot of traffic once this gets properly developed um, at times of the year, of course, not like this. And then there's also the chance here for lots and lots of sight lines, which is different to the facade, which has a much more sort of restricted kind of drive-by. Um, this is going to have you know, sight lines all over that kind of quadrangle. Um, again, going to the, the sort of very mundane contractual requirements. This sort of is, these are the things we're gonna, we're gonna be looking at today. Where the paths go, trees, drainage, lighting, plant locations, all that kind of stuff. There doesn't seem to be anything insuperably difficult in locating the work there, which is a, a nice thing. And it also has this kind of, for me, reference to the, the old facades actually kind of, I find it really appealing. It's incredibly simple. Um, it's almost got a kind of Louis Kahn simplicity, like two materials, you know, concrete and, and brick. 
and this kind of relates to this kind of cruciform symmetry of the structure. So this is where I thought we could put this kind of shadow receiver, this idea of a, of a blank surface that can receive this kind of projected image of something that's floating in front of it and kind of creating an image on it at the same time that's not attached to the building but creating a space in front of the building. Here's some uh, musings from my journals. Uh, one of the, the um, things that I'm particularly interested in when you start to approach that is that there's a set of mathematical terms <coughs> called in chaos theory that actually expresses the evolution of complex or nonlinear systems. So as an idea develops, as it creates connections to new ideas, like let's say you're drawing a diagram or a sketch, the more little connections you add, the more unstable the whole system starts to become, which is the area where art really becomes really kind of powerful as it's this introduction of sort of questioning or uncertainty or searching or seeking. And, but at the same time, there's actually a mathematics governing that. It is a system unto itself. So we started to think about this kind of chaotic attractor space. These are examples of it, the kinds of things that go on in mathematics. And this was famously, you know, what sort of Leonardo spent years trying to draw how water d would, would swirl down a drain. Um, and for years it was believed you just couldn't really mathematically model chaos, but it turns out you can, and you get this as a beautiful one. It's called the Tinkerbell structure. It's supposed to, in the physicist's mind, imitates the path of Tinkerbell as she flies around the Disney castle. And then there's another one called the Henan, very famous bifurcating state. So you can sort of see, you start with one split at the bottom, and then you get two, and then four, and then by the time you get a thousand states, it appears to the human eye as a kind of chaotic structure. But underneath that, there's a kind of, in some of these forms, a kind of stability. So we focused on this thing called the Henan attractor, which is what that one in the bottom right-hand corner is. Uh, this is what happens when you, you sort of let it go and started to produce variants on the site. Um, so one of the big open questions is whether this should, f we created this sort of form, which we're welcome to pass around. Uh, it can be, because of its structural stability, it can be rotated in various directions, and it still re retains its sort of structural shape. And, you know, one of the questions that I'm going to ask you guys to sort of think about is whether it should be a vessel or like a sign or an arbor. You know, those are the three kinds of structural forms where it's most stable. And the other option is whether we should pull it up against the building or push it away from the building to allow traffic between the building, creating a kind of more enclosed plaza space. I tend to favor the freestanding form in the presentation. I'm mostly going to talk about that, but I'm very open to if we kind of want to pull back and think about the wall as a site of engagement, there's issues, positive and negative, for both of those. So the vessel structure, you know, it's pretty simple. It's a bowl um, with a, somebody standing happily inside contemplating the universe. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time on it because I sort of felt in the end that it was going to be, feel a bit more maybe like a cage than a vessel once you sort of imagine yourself in it. And also it's uh, structurally probably the least sound of the options in that every single one of these is a sort of place where people can bounce off. It's very appealing visually, but it's structurally the weakest. So then we looked um, very closely at the arbor, and I'm calling it an arbor because part of the project proposal we'll see later is that climbing plants are permitted, if not encouraged, to grow up it, although it's open to question whether they will. They're very temperamental. Either they will and it'll be too much, we'll be hacking them off, or they won't at all. So the arbor has some really nice qualities in that it creates a kind of internal room and that we would add, you'll see in the kind of the drawings to the structural frame, there's this little kind of filigree on top, a kind of crown. Those would be laser cut elements that would that also add a kind of structural stability because if it has a weakness this way, it's that it creates a kind of soft top. So by adding the laser cut sections as kind of fins, you create a very stable, kind of locked, almost like a keystone effect. So this is something we, um, we have a, at the end of this, we'll, we just made a little AR app and filmed it on site. So we'll, we'll show you 
this particular model sort of located on the site. So this is the sort of seeing a little more of this idea of the shadow generator, is that as the afternoon sun comes in, this is the great virtue of the western facade, it will cast shadows through the structure onto the building. And then we plant native plants um, very around it that would sort of have, uh, create a kind of, a, it's not really a xeriscape there because it gets a lot of rain, but I suspect it's going to have some pretty interesting planting opportunities. So the second option is this kind of thing, the sign, what I've called the sign, which is this sort of vertical orientation. Um, I'm kind of probably right now, this is my favorite of the options. It kind of stands up as a kind of figure in space, creating a, a larger shadow fall on the building. And it also allows a kind of secondary drawing to enter it where we start to add more complex expressive details. This, rather than the fin structures, these are kind of larger segments. Um, and for this model, what we did was we created a secondary geometric form, a pure sphere, mapping the, the drawing, my drawing, on top of it, and then sort of inserting it into the chaotic surface. So it's a kind of two forms, chaos and order, intersecting each other. There's like an invisible sphere passing through the sign and wrapping it with this secondary drawing. So you have a kind of doubling of the figure. Um, so we're going to make this out of uh, something probably quite like this, which Sheehan kindly brought on the plane and was subjected to some, <laughs> some very serious questioning by some very serious people. Like, what exactly is this? <laughs> they said. <laughs> and it's a stainless steel pipe is the frame. So, because one of the kind of challenges of a project like this, you know, outdoor sculpture, is, you know, it's, it's got to be very, very strong for a very long time. So there's kind of a restricted range of materials. So we're, we're it's, it's essentially the same stuff you'd make a playground out of. Because we are anticipating that 300-pound guy will inevitably, sooner or later, feel the urge to climb any one of these structures and sort of swing on it. Um, so here's some test sections of the, the frame with the, in the workshop. Sheehan, who works with me, will talk about that later, the how, how this might work. Um, but we're pretty confident that these, this is a very complex series of curves, that it can be, you know, engineered and made to sort of be a, a very stable structure despite having a very sort of apparently unstable or chaotic form. And then the other kind of part of the project that I'm particularly interested in is, is really integrating it into the site. So thinking very carefully about the brickwork, the paving, the plantings, and the, the wall behind. There's a tendency for institutions to somehow imagine that any blank surface almost requires some kind of security lighting and a small box and a, some wiring to be attached to it, and then maybe a sign, it's kind of random accumulation of detail that is, you know, institutions sort of feel compelled to add one more thing every year until you get this kind of incrustations of odd additions. I know I'm looking at you, like it's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> you were nodding. <laughs> but it, you know how it's, it's a kind of a weird thing. So one of the kind of, um, I think, criteria of the project would be to keep that wall blank, sort of in perpetuity, like to sort of label the wall as like a receiver of shadow from the work, which might prove to be institutionally complex, but worth, worth the effort, I think. Um, and another would be to sort of think about how we can, the support blocks. So we were, uh, f for ADA and just for general safety, but also for use, we thought it would be nice to elevate the structure on a, a set of blocks, uh, 16 inches, 18 inches high, sort of variable height, so that they could also become benches. So they would serve on the one hand as a kind of barrier, preventing anyone from walking into it or biking into it, stopping any obstructions, there's an ADA space between, uh, I think it's 27 and 80 inches you have to keep. You have to keep people offset from it so no one can accidentally hit it. So this would provide a kind of framing. And I thought it'd be nice to have them kind of um, CNC cut out of granite to create an idea that the kind of plaza was actually kind of turning back into nature. And the obvious sort of choice for that for me is the six you know, crystal forms. They're very simple, easy to CNC cut, and you can kind of start to imagine this thing 
rather than sitting on benches, sort of the benches are turning back into nature with like a split face rock. You have a local stone guy who does exactly this. So <laughs> it's happy to find them. And then we'd also notch the plaza area with setbacks so that plants could kind of sort of be seeming to sort of invade the, the geometric structure of it and start to invade and climb up the structure itself. One of them, I was happy to find this passion flower um, is something that's really cultivated in Dallas. It's a very, it does really well here. It's a great ground cover and it likes to climb but not too much and it will die back seasonally so you don't have to deal with the idea of a wisteria or something that's gonna really ultimately destroy the structure. It's a pretty gentle, well, we've talked to the horticulturalist here. She seems excited about having an adventure. And the other thing I really like to do, although I notice there isn't very much on the grounds, is just seed a lot of native species, wildflowers that are just going to recur sort of randomly. So you get these kind of little spots of color popping up here and there. And you really just have to dump, you know, like thousands of seeds in there and you kind of see what happens. Then in terms of like uh, finishing the project, um, We've discussed something that I'd again really appreciate and put on as a long-term question with sort of finished outdoor sculpture is this question of what constitutes the moment you have to redo it. So I'm, there's an, a wide range of options. I'm looking into right now and quite excited about the idea of pre-distressing pre the surface so that it's kind of got a kind of texture rather than just being a smooth veneer like that pipe. Um, so I was thinking about these kinds of um, finishes. But there's really, you know, the, the color question is one of these kind of great, there's obviously classic Ford black, go for white. I put a green one in and then I mm -hmm. took it out again because I thought it was too dangerous <laughs> to have it. Um, we, we could have metallic finishes, some kind of golden uh, or bronze. And then the last sort of like really just ticking off the last couple of boxes on the uh, proposal sort of manifesto, you know, the typical public safety requirements, because I know it's going to come up and it will come up again and again, is you have to take all reasonable steps to ensure. But then if somebody decides to injure themselves, you're legally not obliged to prevent all possibilities of injury. Otherwise, we would be making a playground with a rubber floor and you know all that kind of stuff. It's uh, so I think we're we're sort of in the zone of something that's reasonably safe with any of the options, but obviously that's something that legal are going to have to look at very carefully. And typically, I, I like to make outdoor projects that just require the same maintenance crew. They just come in, they hose it down, they weed it. You're not dealing with any special requests because that's really what you're going to get about five years out. <laughs> so you may as well just think ahead to that guy. Also going back to the, the scratched finish, that's a plus for him too. Um, so these are the, the kind of scaling issues of the two options that I've sort of talked about most. That's the sort of size I'm imagining the arbor and that's the, how high the sign could go. Again, something we should, we should sort of really think very carefully about. And um, I think Sheehan, did, were you able to get that onto the no, but Sheehan has a, an iPad he can pass around yeah, yeah. with a video showing the, the Arbor model on the site, sort of us, us poking around. Thank you. That's my, my idea. <laughs>